Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Asian American Students Association and the Office of the Dean of Undergraduate Students, it is a privilege to gather together for the fourth event in the Focus Series, a conversation with author and writer Charles Yu and Professor Paul Nadal. In addition to our sponsors, Asa and Otis, I'd like to extend a special thank you to the Undergraduate Student Government and the USG Projects Board for their support in making this event a reality. Focus events are designed to encourage racial equity throughout the Princeton community by offering the chance to participate in meaningful discussions with some of the world's foremost writers, activists, and thinkers. In the wake of recent attacks on Asian American elders in San Francisco and Oakland, it feels timely that we remind ourselves of the increased xenophobia and racism that have been directed toward the Asian American community during the COVID-19 pandemic. As we listen to Charles and Professor Nadal, I invite you to reflect on the role race plays in your life and how you can take steps to promote racial equity, keeping in mind that no oppression is second class. We hope tonight's discussion can serve as a catalyst, spurring continued reflection and action, recognizing that this is one step in a longer journey towards justice. In a few moments, you'll hear from our distinguished speakers. In light of our remote reality, this program is being recorded and will be posted on the Otis website. I encourage you to submit your questions in the comment section of the platform on which you're watching, whether it's YouTube or Facebook Live. I now have the pleasure of introducing ASA's outreach chair, Jerry Zhao, class of 24. Born in Canada, Jerry spent the next 12 years of his life in Beijing before moving back to Toronto in middle school. He now resides in Rocky College and plans to pursue an Orphe degree. Even during COVID, you can't keep Jerry out of the gym where he's first in line to hit the weights. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. So also super excited to partner with Otis to host one of today's most brilliant writers, Charles Yu, to present insightful narratives about how race and stereotypes operate in today's America. So Charles Yu is the author of four books including Interior Chinatown, which is the winner of the 2020 National Book Award for Fiction. He received the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35 Award and was nominated for two Writers Guild of America Awards for his work on the HBO series Westworld. He has also written for shows on FX, AMC, and HBO. His fiction and nonfiction have appeared in the New York the New Yorker, the New York, New York Times, excuse me, the Wall Street Journal, Wired, among other publications. A native Californian, Charles Yu graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, with a degree in molecular and cellular biology and a minor in creative writing. After law school at Columbia, Charles practiced law for a number of years before writing for full time. And on the other hand, we have Professor Paul Nadal, who inter interviewed Charles Yu before opening the discussions to questions from students. At Princeton, Professor Nadal is jointly appointed in the Department of English and the Program in American Studies. He teaches courses on Asian American literature and culture and served as a faculty fellow at the Scholars Institute Fellowship Program, which was Princeton's mentorship program for first year generation and low income students. Professor Nadal is also serving as an elected delegate member representing Southeast Asian and Diaporic Studies at the Modern Language Association. Professor Nodal was born in the Philippines and also has roots in California, having received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Currently, he is completing a book on the literatures of Philippine diaspora entitled Remnants Fiction, which exam exams examines how writers abroad have grappled with the ongoing transformation of the Philippines into one of the world's largest labor, labor export economies today. So a reminder for all the attendees, please use the live stream chat function to submit your questions that you may have. And without further ado, let's give our warmest welcome to Charles Yu and Professor Nadal. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. And thank you indeed, Charlie, for sharing your work with the Princeton community and with everyone tuning in tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Um, so I have to say, first off, congratulations on the National Book Award. It's very well deserved. And for those who are not familiar with the award, the National Book Award, or the NBAs, as it's often enduringly called, is a very, very big deal. 
someone described it to me once as the Oscars of American literature, <laughs> and they really do mean it. I've been to two of their ceremonies in New York, and they really they roll out the red carpet um, for writers, no less, and in my case, for for their for their partners. Um, but yes, congratulations. Chinatown Interior is an extraordinary book. I'm actually teaching it right now in my Asian American literature class this semester, and um, we just simply ran out of time discussing it. Um, this is because the novel is so rich. It's about so many things, about being Chinese in America, about finding one's sense of self in place, particularly when one when when uh, when one finds oneself in a society that doesn't really know what quite to do with them. It is about the difference between performing and being. It is about family. It is also about American race relations, how Asian Americans find themselves invisible and constantly stuck in a racial plot that seems only to see only in two colors, black and white. And of course, the novel is about Chinatown, a fantasy, an idea, a real place, what historian Charlotte Brooks calls America's first segregated neighborhood. And for many, it is home. I and my students also found the book to be extremely inventive and playful. It mixes genres, the detective novel, the procedural cop show, martial arts, TV sitcom, and unfolding all these in a book, strikingly, written in a typewriter font, which makes the novel physically read like a screenplay. Um, you, um, when you pick it, when you pick up the book, and I suggest if you haven't, if you don't, if you haven't yet read Interior China, uh, 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 Interior Chinatown, that you go out or perhaps more safely go, you know, purchase it online to read it yourself. And what you'll find is that you'll move in and out of the novel's different orders of fictionality, and it's just simply quite a lot of fun. Um, so Charlie, I wanted to begin by asking you about your own journey to Chinatown, in this case, Chinatown the book, your book, in order to invite you to say a few words about your approach to novel writing, to fiction. For this, I want to read a short passage that appears early in the novel. Um, it's a passage where the narrator describes the single room occupancy dwellings of the Chinese characters in your novel. So let me read the sh very brief uh, passage slowly. So the narrator says, a room isn't a layout, a footprint. It's a space, a volume. And when you start to understand that, you can't believe how much volume there is in here. You hang things and you hang things on those things. You stack and pile and cram. You make use of every available cubic unit of your life not just a floor plan or a schematic. And so I'm curious about this other more capacious sense of space and how, um, and how we might think of it as a metaphor for entering in and writing and working within the parameters of the novel. I ask this question because clearly the book is about spaces and places. Um, there's one, you know, a line that's repeated throughout is location, location, location. Uh, but to me, the screenplay format creates this interesting kind of visual flattening of literary space, right? But you don't actually get that because you managed in this novel to create a genuinely three-dimensional world. And so I want to ask, uh, so and I want us to begin with, um, you know, by inviting you to say a few words about the space of the novel and what about Chinatowns um, perhaps for you that inspired this idea and approach to your fiction. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I Really quick, uh, I just wanted to thank Jerry and Mitchell and everyone at Otis and, uh, and the Princeton community for uh, allowing me to you know, be here with you. It's quite a privilege and an honor. Uh, and to you, Professor, for you know, one, those really sort of generous words and also framing that in such a uh, way that will make me seem smarter than I am. Uh, I will now just I will now dispel that uh, aura of smartness as I start to talk. But um, you know, you you really said it already. I think I do think of novels as spaces. Um, the thing I'm looking for as a reader is when um, you feel like you are not entering a two dimensional you know page of text but you've slipped into 
someone's consciousness and there's this mm -hmm. kind of envelope around you now where you feel yourself inside and then you are looking through a i don't know a scrim or something at through the novel and and so you can both feel um yourself and feel the consciousness of whatever you've entered and the, and also the gap in between and to me mm -hmm that's when I really become transported or whatever magical process happens when I read, you know, um, certain kinds of fiction uh, that really work on that level. And that's, you know, not, <laughs> so my approach to writing fiction is to try for that if possible, not always successful, but um, I think it's, it's so interesting to hear the, the part you, you chose um, because I, I you know, it is really a kind of, um, uh, you know, capsule of the, mm -hmm. the concept as a whole, which is to take some space or um, characters that are generally relegated to the background that are very flattened two-dimensional stereotypes, which is the background Asians, you mm -hmm. know, in sort of past generations of TV. I think things are changing a bit now and maybe we can talk about that, but, um, you know, th this role that, Asians in sort of the American cultural imagination, I guess, had been relegated to and, and still are to some extent, and try to expand that and say, let's mm. go inside of it and let's look at the third dimension. Um, and, and also it is a literal description of this place where the characters live as well. So I was trying to work, you know, you, you said, I think you said orders of fictionality, which is like yeah. such a cool phrase and sort of how I was thinking about, um, you know, how do you slip between levels? How do you work um, a narrative and then also kind of comment on that narrative without, you know, straining too much to, so the screenplay format really sort of helped me jump in and out of that, jump between the orders um, pretty right. easily. Yeah, yeah. And of course the screenplay format also foregrounds um, character characterization, right? Now the novel is, very much interested in thinking about, you know, this question of what it means to be Chinese in America or Asian American as a dawning on of a certain kind of role or character, right? So there's a sense in which identity too is a is kind of spatial, and something that's external that you put on that becomes part of your your interiority, as it were. Um, and so, I one of the one of the uh, moments in your novel that stayed with me is. There's um, um, a moment when Willy Wu, so the, the main character who is generic Asian man who aspires to be Kung Fu guy, um, notes that there's something uncanny about being Asian or appearing or looking Asian, um, that, um, that being Asian disrupts the order of reality, right? Precisely because people don't really know what to do with with you, um, because of this narrow worldview of race relations as just black and white. And his perspective, you know, at times he feels constrained, he feels trapped, but he also realizes that it affords him a certain view into the world, right? Um, that he has access to 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 a certain kind of truth. And so I, I wanted to ask about, you know, this I, what led you to this idea of identity as performance? Um, you know, the researcher, the scholar, part of me looked, you know, at the, you know, I could see the footnotes, right? You were reading um, Goffman, you were reading, you know, Onitsu's work on uh, American Chinatowns. Um, but I really thought that what you did with this idea of ethnic racial identity as a performance was really smart. And I uh, wonder if you could just say a little bit more about um, that idea. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I, yeah, I, I think there's, um, I, I, I encountered, uh, uh, Irving Goffman's book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, um, in a UCLA bookstore a years ago. And I, at the time I was working as a lawyer and uh, it was just one of those 
you know, book bookstore moments that I really miss about physical bookstores of like, you're not really looking, you don't know what you're looking for, yeah. but you're hoping you stumble on something. And I'd never heard of it. I only later did I realize this is like seminal work in the field and hugely influential. And, but it just stuck with me. I remember reading it and coming back to it. And um, I, I always wanted to, I think over the years, I actually had tried a few stabs at like, how is self, you know, like performance, basically, how do we, you know, communicate in and out of character? How do we basically um, signal to people? Or what do we act like when we think we're not being watched? Uh, and I, I think I just had never quite found a place for that to go. I think I was always trying mm. to horn it into work. Um, meanwhile, I was working on this book for years and kind of getting nowhere with it. Mm. Um, mm. it, it existed as this kind of amorphous collection of like fables about assimilation. And I didn't have the right form. And it was just one of those like moments where, you know, I don't have them very often. I've only had a few, but you know, the first lines of the book sort of just popped into my head. And I thought, mm. oh, here's Willis Wu. He's an actor. He's an Asian actor. He's a background oriental, basically, is what he calls himself. And um and with with Willis, the character came this idea, the framework of, oh, I could write this as a script for a show, you know, and then I get to do all this Goffman stuff, you know, it's very exciting. I was like, mm -hmm. I, can, I can sneak it all in there and, and not sneak it in there. It, it wouldn't feel forced. It was like, oh, this is a framework, um, meaning sometimes being Asian in America feels like being the guy with no lines in a show that's not about you. You know, you just mm -hmm. get a very different perspective when you're always standing in the back and you're never talking. You know what the leads look like, you know, you know what the sides of their faces look like. You just sort of see this whole production, but you see it from this different angle. You know, you're not the audience exactly. You're kind of the unobserved observer off to the side. And so yeah. I just sort of off to the races once I, you know, kind of settle on that idea. Yeah, and I, I want to hear more actually um, this bit about, you know, it took you, you worked on this novel for a long time and then an idea sparked that helped, helped this formal problem of exactly what voice, what framework to, to, to use to tell this story. Um, and, and so the, um, one of the things I was thinking about is um, the use of the second person pronoun, the you, right? Um, the decision to um, use that point of view, because on the one hand, it's almost like a refusal of the, the autobiographical memoir I, right? Um, that's not what we get. We don't get actually into his thoughts, um, but we get this, the second person narration where, you know, the you might be the reader, but it's actually Willis Wu and, you know, it displaces the point of view so that you see him taking on these other roles as a kind of third person, as it were. Um, and so was, I, I kind of want, I, I'd be curious to hear just you reconstruct, you know, your decision to write in this voice. Yeah. Um... It, it, it there's like sort of two ways to talk about it one that's more honest than the other um <laughs> i'll do both uh because i think they're both relevant and, you know I, I love that question um and the way you framed it i think um when i started to write this i it came out sort of in like a, a rush of ideas you know it was one of those like feverish periods where you get uh, you know, it, again, pretty rare event for me, but it's like, oh, I, I'm onto something that's interesting to me. I feel like I, I have something, but it didn't feel right. It didn't sound right. Mm. So this is the honest version of like, I actually toggled back and forth between first and third person. Uh, I would have days, uh, this is a very weird form of procrastination, but uh, I would have days where I would just um, switch, you know, I mean, it, I would switch between first and third. I would just go through, like, mm. well, maybe this is why it's not working. Um, and then I 
I don't know exactly when it entered the stream of consciousness, but it was like, what about second person? You know, like I was, some voice was saying that. And it's at first for me, like a knee jerk, like, don't know. Like, why would you do that? You know, I, I've read books that I like in second person, but I just <laughs> like, you're already writing something in screenplay format. Uh, it's just too many things to sort of ask, you know, it's like too many buy-ins. Um, but I, I couldn't get that feeling away. And, and so, but again, this is, some of this is like kind of hindsight reconstruction. I, I feel like in the moment it was much more intuitive mm. of like, why does this not feel right? And so this part, I don't know if is honest, but I think later I was like sort of preemptively defending second person. I think ready, getting ready for like my editor to say, why is this in second person? They, he never ended up asking that question. I mean, I think he got it, but forcing myself to articulate why was helpful. And I think um, for this moment right now, so I can answer your question. Yeah. Which is, um, you know, it, it, for me, it does a couple things. It, it, um, it, like you said, you said it really well, so I won't try to repeat that. It, it has that action on kind of what it does for the reader and, and what they, how they see Willis in moments, you know, at times he's supposed to be sort of in control, but other times it's supposed to feel like there's a narrative being imposed on him or a kind of dialogue between what is this mm -hmm. voice who's telling him what to do. But, uh, but really it also functions like an interior monologue itself kind of just told through second person. And I think on some level, it's the idea of as an Asian American, you know, character who often doesn't get the full subjectivity, you know, granted to other people to say you, maybe that will situate mm. other readers to go, oh, this is me. Okay. I guess I'll put on this costume for the, you know, as I read this, I, I don't know if that actually works with people's brain machinery, but that was... That was my thought. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a way where the second person, you know, hails the reader as a participant of the, you know, the literary universe that you're building for, that, that Willis Wu finds himself in and that you're constructing, and, you know, for, for your character. Um, and I thought that that use of the second person is what makes the voice of your novel so new and so inventive, I think, because, you know, I, I thought of other works in Asian American literature where Chinatown is featured. So I'm thinking here of Louis Chu's Eat a Bowl of Tea, or more recently, Karen Te um book, The Eye Hotel. Um, and I, I couldn't also but help in your novel's interest in stereotypes and representation, um, and also the play on the you know the drama form, I couldn't help but think of David Henry Wong's *And Butterfly*, which you know it's a work that's also invested in in deconstructing Orientalist representations of Asians. Um, but so I wanted to. Uh, the question is why representation for you. Um, you know, you are a practitioner, an artist of, of writing, and you, your raw materials are representations, as it were. Um, but why representations? And maybe say a few words about what makes it so maybe politically urgent for you, and especially in this moment when we, you know, some would say that we do see a kind of mainstreaming of Asian Americans, right? So think here of Crazy Rich Asians, think here of, you know, the, the proliferation of sitcoms. Well, not proliferation, that might be too, you know, an exaggeration, but, you know, more than, more than, um, than the 90s, say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I just opened my blue book, blue book to a very difficult <laughs> exam question. Uh, <laughs> Like oh, I'm at Princeton. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I. Why representation? I think um, there's you know a 
I, I grew up, I'm in my mid forties. So I grew up watching TV in the eighties and nineties largely. And you just didn't see representations of Asians on TV um, or in movies. And what few there were, were off, uh, often, you know, either just very flattened um, stereotypes mm. or caricatures even. Um, and so there was this kind of simultaneous feeling of like, you know, surprise and almost like, not, I don't know, maybe pride or just like, oh, you know, like that's interesting, that's novel, just excitement, right? Because it's it was so uncommon and then um, sort of followed quickly by uh, embarrassment or just ambivalence about the, the representation itself. Um, and now I call them sort of like Asians in my cop show moments where it's like, <laughs> You know, there it, it's less so as you pointed out. It's less so now, but it's like, oh, what are these Asians doing in this cop show? You know, it's breaking my reality. You know, and like, I think unpacking that in the course of writing this book, uh, I, I sort of was like, well, why does it break the reality of TV? Well, you know, and and some of this maybe will seem obvious, but it, I, for whatever reason, it wasn't super obvious to me as I was writing. Was TV operates by this kind of parallel set of rules? that is like a simulation of actual mm -hmm. reality. You know, it's a distortion or filtering of racial reality in America, especially if you live in big cities, you know, uh, <laughs> everyone knows Asians, you know, uh, you see them at the hospital, you see them at the grocery store, you see them on the street at the post office, but you just don't see them on your screen, you know, from for decades as mm -hmm. I was growing up, you just, didn't, that was one place you didn't see them. And the disconnect between those two realities was such that when one kind of crossed into the other, when you all of a sudden saw an Asian in a show, you're like, oh yeah, that's right. This In this reality, I'm not supposed to see that. Mm. Um, I think that has a powerful cumulative effect or it did on me anyway, like this unconscious invisibility of like, they don't exist here. And that's like such a important force. I mean, I spend more hours watching television than I do most other activities in my mm -hmm. life, sadly, at least as a kid. So. What does that do? You know, not just for the Asians or an Asian Americans watching, but for the non-Asian Americans watching, for all the other Americans watching too. It's like you don't see this kind of face or body on your screen. You know, and mm -hmm. this I think applies not just to Asian Americans, but to lots of other underrepresented groups. Right? I mean, people of color, you know, queer characters, disabled characters, just even characters with just sort of non-TV normative body types. Right? So like, yeah. For years and years, I just watched one, basically one type of person on television, right? And what does that do to your conception? Sorry, my dog just chose right now to go crazy. Um, the UPS guy is apparently very um, an enemy. So, um, you know, what does that do? You know, what does that do to us? I, I feel like I didn't get quite to the second part of your question, but I probably talked long enough. Maybe we can <laughs> come back. Yeah, later. yeah, yeah. Well, one of the um, popular cultural representations um, that appears in the novel as a kind of, you know, um, kind of way to organize the story is um, Bruce Lee. Right? Um, the um, the the model for uh, Willie Wu's aspiration to be um, Kung Fu guy. Um, I myself didn't watch Bruce Lee <laughs> movies, um, but I read um, what v Vijay Prashad has written about Bruce Lee, and it's really fascinating just how um, you know he struggled. Bruce Lee struggled with the fact that the um, the work that he was getting was to play these stereotypes of of, of, of Asian men. Um, and of Asia. Um, did you watch a lot of Bruce Lee growing up? You said you mentioned that you watched you watched a lot of TV. Um, I did. I I remember you know getting VHS versions of Fists of Fury and Chinese Connection. Um, just thinking like you know where you know where's this guy been? Like this is so exciting. All of a sudden, there's this sort of real life, you know almost superhero type person. Like he just seemed, so for, forget the fact that like he's, uh, you know, he's uh, Asian, he, he's he's just 
or for any like I think he's one of these sort of unassailable, unassailably cool pantheon level people where any mm -hmm. kid would be like Bruce Lee. Yeah, Bruce Lee is cool. Like you cannot, <laughs> uh, not arguable, right? Uh, that was pretty. You know, it, it, what does that do to have such a? You know, at least you have like sort of one thing to grasp onto as a kid of like, well. I don't. I'm not. I'm not going to be Bruce Lee, but maybe there's some hope for me if there's like someone who kind of, you know, I guess I sort of look like in in a in the vaguest sense of like racial, superficial racial characteristics. Like, it, I think it went to some like at immature or like in in unarticulated sense of uh, anxiety. Like, mm. how can how can I be like? A protagonist when I've never seen a protagonist that looks anything like me at all, you know. Again, that's not how a kid thinks, but you know, and and it, not to put it just through the lens of race, but I think there is some something powerful about seeing, you know, someone you just haven't seen up to that point. So I, I guess for me, that's what you know, Bruce Lee. Did. Also, it's like incredibly, you know, <laughs> acrobatic and and gifted yeah. and, and charismatic. So yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, so I think we will, um, so there are a lot of students in the room. We can't see them, but they're, they're, you know, there are scores of them and they are clamoring to ask their questions. So we'll um, transition to that portion of the program now. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. All right. Hi, Charles. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Lee, class of 2023, and I'm the co-president of Princeton's Asian American Students Association. Our first question will be from my co-moderator and fellow co-president, Kay Savan Srivala Puthar, class of 2023. Hi, uh, I'm Kay Savan, class of 2023, co-president of ASA, just as Jennifer mentioned. And so my question is that a common phenomenon for content creators has been dubbed writer's block, especially in light of the lengthy quarantine lockdowns from 2020. How have you managed to stay inspired through it all? Who or what has been your greatest inspiration, both personally and as a professional writer? Ooh. Thank you uh, um, for the question. Um, it has been hard, I'll be honest, um, to stay inspired. I think I've gone through phases. Uh, what I used to call, you know, like mid pandemic, which was like a very sort of naive statement. Cause now it's like, what is the middle? Like, we don't know where the end is. So how do how did I know it was the middle? But a few months ago I hit a lull where I just was like, I'd wake up and not get anything done. And, and all day long, I felt like I was in a rush and somehow still never got anything done. Um, I don't know if that's an effect of just being stuck inside or what, but you know, but at the other hand, on the other hand, like a lot of the just sort of basic activities of life have been really nourishing, like being around my wife and kids so much, taking walks, like not being able to go anywhere or like do things that would normally just distract us or take the whole weekend up. Just like, this is what we get to do today. We get to go for a walk as a family and it's pretty great. Um, or go walk my dog, you know, and like the kind of quiet, the quieting down and the slowing down of like daily rhythm has actually made me more productive in some ways. Um, and yeah, so I think in some ways, you know, that's kind of inspired me, which is like watching my, like the saddest thing I've ever seen, I think, not the saddest thing I've ever seen, a very sad thing I've seen is like when my kids are doing PE on Zoom, which is like, it, <laughs> It, because on the one hand, it's an absurd activity, right? I mean, they're literally like moving around in a chair. On the other hand, what else are they supposed to do? And they're trying really hard at it. And I guess that's sort of inspirational, you know? It's like, it's like if, well, if they're gonna do it, I, I should be trying harder and then I get back to work. That, yep, the quarantine <laughs> just is like that sometimes. Yeah. Um, so we have we have another student question from uh, Jessica Wang, class of twenty four. Um, yes. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. 
Um, my question is, why did you first major in molecular and cell biology, and what made you end up becoming a writer? Um, could you talk about what drove your career changes from a science background to law, and then eventually to writing? Sure. Thanks, Jessica. Um, you know, as I was saying before with one of uh, Professor Nadal's questions, uh, there's an honest answer, and then there's like the retrospect answer. The honest answer in the moment was, my parents wanted me to be a doctor and uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't have any strong feelings that I wouldn't be one. I, I didn't, I didn't actually, I could never actually imagine being a doctor, but I, I majored in M MCB and kind of muddled my way through it. But I knew that all along I would want to write. I didn't think I'd like end up writing stuff, but I just knew I wanted to spend some time writing in college. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, you know, in a lot of ways, I think I was trying to fulfill roles of like being a dutiful son, mm -hmm. you know, and being a responsible son of like immigrant parents from Taiwan who would like, we came here with nothing. You don't get to just go do creative writing, you know, like, come on. And um, so after I did not get into medical school, I went to law school. And again, it was like, it's something where it felt like a balance of like, I can read and write and maybe even do this for a living and it'll be a stable, you know, sort of productive thing to do um, that won't make my parents feel like worried about me. Um, and at the same time, maybe I'll like find some creative outlet, which is sort of what I did, you know, as I started practicing law at the same time, I started writing short stories and sending them to like journals and magazines. So I, you know, I, it's so weird when I look at it, cause it just looks like a totally random walk, you know, from like undergrad to end up ending up doing TV writing for my livelihood. But um, in retrospect, you know, reading and writing was always really important. And only after I started writing for TV, did it ever really become at all like something I depended on for money. So I think in some ways that was very freeing. Like I never saw it as a livelihood. Um, so, so yeah, that's sort of the summary. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. Thanks. I think our, a lot of our Princeton students love hearing about your path because it really is so inspiring and there's a lot that we can learn from all the different turns that you have gone on. And our next student question will come from Akane Wang, class of 2024. Hi, nice to meet you as well. So my question is, well, one hallmark of the tedious literary publication process is how difficult it can be to become a published author. In a recent New York Times article, you mentioned how when you are still a full-time lawyer, you personally experienced hundreds of rejections for your short stories. Now, after being recognized by the National Book Foundation and the Writers Guild for America, it seems like everything's changed. If you could talk to your postgraduate self, what advice would you give in terms of education, career, or life in general? Great, thanks, Akane. Um, ooh. I could talk to my postgraduate self. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, do your laundry more often. That's gross. <laughs> I only realize with shame now how, how gross I must have been. And like, <laughs> I've actually married it. Um, hmm. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it's like looking back, um, it, it felt. It felt so terrible to get all those rejections, you know. Uh, but there was also after a certain like amount of them, you start to get desensitized, and you just sort of say, "Well, this is you know, this is what it is." You know, I, I, I guess I'm, uh, I guess I'm just going to have to like, I, I don't know. I guess you just really start to doubt yourself. Um, um, but that's probably not at all unique. I don't know that it's changed that much, to be honest. I mean, it has changed in some sense. Like, of course, now, you know, if I write something, I feel like, well, at least my editor will want to look at it. I don't, I, but it doesn't like decrease the amount of anxiety I have about whether or not it's going to be any good or anyone will want to read it. Or um, I, I almost think that's a, 
a good thing, right? I mean, I think if it, like a sense of complacency or comfort would be pretty deadening or difficult to overcome because as soon as, you know, I stop, um, you know, holding myself to, to accountable to like a standard then, uh, or, or just relax any sense of like, basically I just need to stay as self-loathing as I am to, to produce anything good. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm still struggling with like what advice I would give myself. It's weird at some level and it, it might just be retroactive, like nostalgia. I sort of miss times where I just didn't know what I was doing. You know, like I just had no idea. Now I feel constrained by like, no, that's not possible. You're not good at that, you know, or you tried that. When I was first writing things, I just wrote them. You know, I didn't, I didn't have any craft. I didn't, I'd never taken a fiction workshop. I took poetry workshops. Um, so I guess that, that might be something I would say. It's like, you know, enjoy this freedom. And even if it seems impossible to, impossible, enjoy writing for no one, you know, so. Yeah. So, so the takeaway is, the takeaway is be an English major and get a certificate in Asian American studies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think kind of on that note, I think that's something a lot of Princeton students, we, we sometimes struggle with seeing the, uh, the, um, like we only want to see results and we forget about the process that goes behind it. And I think that's very important for us to keep in mind. Um, so yeah, so our next question comes from Brian Wang, uh, who is a student of Professor Nadal's. Brian. Hi, uh, Charlie, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm currently a student of, of Professor Nadal's taking his class titled Asian American Literature and Culture. Um, on Tuesday, actually, we were uh, discussing race and genre in the context of interior Chinatown. Um, so I think your novel has been one way through which I've been increasingly like conscious about my Asian American identity existing in a space which you characterize as something in between or oppression that is second class. If you wouldn't mind, I'm curious as to how your relationship to your own Asian American identity has changed over time. So mm -hmm. what events or experiences have shaped your own Asian American consciousness? Great, thanks, Brian. Um, um, are you, I, I guess I have a question for you, which is, are you like getting extra credit for being here or is this a <laughs> uh, Are you graded on that question? Yeah. Is, is an a uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll definitely- Participation grades. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, getting some brownie points in here, I guess, but I'll probably part of the course. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, it's weird. I grew up in Southern California where, um, you know, for the first, until high school, uh, we lived in an area that didn't have very many Asians. And then in high school, we, my parents, we or my family moved to an area that had significantly more. So my high school was probably like, I, I don't know, I wanna say 25% Asian American, something like that. Um, you know, uh, and um, so I think, in some way, and then I went to Berkeley, which is like 40% Asian American. So in some ways I had like a luxury and probably somewhat of a blind spot as to, you know, how, um, what sort of maybe tolerant or at least comfortable, you know, like facially comfortable people were. I, I didn't experience a lot of overt, you know, like sort of discrimination. I, I mean, there was schoolyard stuff. I remember getting like, you know, people doing slanty eyes or calling me Ching Chong or, you know, actually getting, you know, punched and stuff like beaten up. But it, it wasn't like that was a overwhelming feature of my consciousness was like, I'm, uh, for instance, I had kid, I had cousins who grew up in areas where they were the only Asian kid in their school, you know, and um, how different that must have been. Um, I think it was more when I went to law school and sort of moved away from my bubble, even though that was in New York City, it still was pretty different from California in my experience. I remember being a lot more conscious of my face, of you know, feeling sometimes like, oh, 
I'm the only person that looks like this in here, you know, um, even though I spent a lot of time, you know, hanging out with like um, uh, other Asian Americans, um, but I also spent a lot of time not. And so, and I think when it really changed was when I started working in, in, at, at a big law firm. And there were a lot of times where I was suddenly the only, you know, person of color in the room. Um, and I think, you know, I, I describe it as like going through long stretches of just not thinking about it and then having, you know, those stretches of then being punctuated by like moments of acute aware, like acutely becoming aware, like, oh yeah, that's what I look like. And that's how these people are seeing me in this moment. Um, and that disconnect is a lot of, you know, sort of what drove me to want to sort of explore Willis, you know, in his kind of dual consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's like a character, you know, and then as a, as a subject. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting that like you talk about um, like growing up in like SoCal, uh, with, you know, uh, like this overly represented like Chinese population. So like I actually grew up um, in NorCal. So I grew up in San Jose and I feel like um, like as a freshman, like when I talk to other like Asian Americans, I feel like I have this very like unique experience in terms of like growing up where um, I felt like at times like I was like a majority, like my high school, like you, you say how your high school is like 25% Asian. I feel like my high school was um, like definitely over half, uh, like I would say like 70% like Asian and like Indian population. So I feel like um, coming to the East Coast, like there's definitely like a cultural difference. Um, and I'm just curious as to like, it's interesting how you say that there's like different points in your life where um, this like consciousness or this awareness becomes like more acute. Um, and I guess like that transition to the professional world is something interesting to take note of. Yeah. Yeah, 70%. My, my wife's family is from Northern California too. So um, I can imagine. Um, that that's a whole different sort of world too. It's, you know, talking about like sort of different ways of immigration, like a lot of the people up there, well, as you know, like, uh, you know, their families have been here much longer than most families in Southern California. Like they came in sort of earlier, earlier decades. So, um, but yeah, it is interesting to hear your perspective. Thank you, Brian. And so, uh, Professor Nadal, we also wanted to say, feel free to answer when we talk about uh, Asian representation sure. for the rest of the conversation. Um, please absolutely feel free to jump in. Sure. Um, Thank you. So, Jen. Yeah, at this time, we'll be opening the floor for student questions from the live YouTube and Facebook chat. Our first question comes from Cheyenne Zhang, class of 2022. She says, thank you for being here. I saw that you've worked in TV in the past on shows like Westworld. What differences have you seen as an Asian American in the television and movie world versus the novel world? Hmm. Uh, thanks, Cheyenne. Um, well, um, as an Asian American in the novel world, uh, it's weird because I don't exist in that world. You know what I mean? I exist uh, once every five to seven years for about six months, and then I stop existing until I write another book. So it, it's just different. You know, I, I have, um, I, I think TV is so collaborative. You spend so much time you know, in a room with a small number of people when you're a writer, you just sort of sit in the writer's room for the whole day. And um, I've only started working it a few years ago. And I think I have, have had like, like the good fortune to uh, work in a time where there's a lot of um, interest uh, and enthusiasm for different points of view. Um, and I think because of the space I'm working in, which is like dramas that are on streamers or you know what they call prestige cable. Th this isn't like um, the bruising comedy rooms where like everyone's from like places like Harvard or Princeton and everyone's just trying to like <laughs> out joke each other. Th th these are like really sort of, uh, you know, a lot of ways really sensitive, thoughtful conversations where people want to tell stories and 
So I just feel like I've had a really great experience so far. That said, I've also been the only Asian American in the room for all of my jobs so far, other than Westworld, where one of the showrunners is actually Asian American. But other than that, I, you know, it is an interesting thing to be the only person in the room. And like when there's an, especially if there's a character, like an Asian American character in the cast, uh, you know, both like feeling anxious, excited, but also a little bit of dread about like, uh oh, you know, like what's going to happen when they decide they want to tell a story about, am I going to have to become the voice of, of, you know, Asian stuff, you know, as soon as they start telling that story. I, and, and granted, it's, it's not, usually it's usually much more sort of thoughtful than that but um there's there's a it feels like there's a little bit of pressure sometimes to speak for a group and you're like i i, I can't i can't do that uh professor nadal I, if you had any thoughts on that as well um well i think it'll exist for in the novel world for more than six months, <laughs> um, yeah. I'm teaching Asian American literature again in the fall and I'll be teaching um, your, your work. Uh, no, but I think this, this, um, this issue of representation, this question of representation um, exists on multiple levels, you know, not only in the story itself, but also the task of representing a community and one's responsibility for the writer's responsibility for that. Um, and I, what I really appreciated about Inter, Inter Chinatown is how a representation becomes kind of this object to be looked at, probed into and inhabit, dwell, take on, perform. And um, I, I thought that you, um, really approach that question in a really smart way. Thank you. And so as for, we have another question from YouTube from um, Marika Almeida. And so that is in light of the recent news of Hulu's adaptation of Interior Chinatown, what are your hopes and fears in translating this novel into a film ad adoption? Um, well, I'll start with the fears. Thank you for that. Uh, question. Yeah, I think the hopes are that it can be something that is, um, you know, captures or, or, or reaches people that connects with people that, you know, even in a broader sense in the book, I mean, that that's the brute reality is like, as, as much as the book has found a wider audience, you know, thanks to the award and, and like, wonderful things like this, um, it's still not going to have the reach of like, even the smallest TV show. Uh, so mm -hmm. I hope, you know, to have that people might connect with it and find it and, and find something of their own experience or just feel like it touches them or it entertains them anyway. I, my fears are that I won't be able to figure out how to do that because, you know, the book, uh, was a bit of a tied me up in knots for a few years. And I don't know, if, you know, I'll, I'll be really honest. I, I'm trying to crack that as, you know that's sort of what my days are filled with now is trying to figure out if I can do that. I might have to uh, <laughs> pick Professor Nadal's brain at some point about, wait, what does the book mean when I say this? <laughs> can you help me understand the themes of this book? I, I forgot. Uh, yeah, shoot me an email. Okay. Or text. <laughs> I might take you up. <laughs> I love that. And actually, one of our students, Sophia Chen, class of 2024 on YouTube, had a question about that. Um, in your book, Willis Wu dreamt about becoming the Kung Fu guy because it's the most attainable dream he can have as an Asian man. Do you think that the mainstream media is moving away from the confines of race and that Asians could one day have the possibility to play any types of protagonists in any types of movies? I mean, that's like, feels like something that a few years ago would have been crazy to even think about. And now it seems like just to even have that as a question. So if, you know, I, maybe I'm just a glass half full person, but I feel like it's exciting to even entertain that possibility. I think 10 years ago, it would have been hard to imagine like the kinds of things that are on now. Um, so 
yeah, I mean, I, I want to hope that it is that we're moving anyway, that we're definitely moving in that direction. It's encouraging. And even if that is driven largely by just the fact that there's, you know, 600 shows and like, you know, uh, there's shows premiering on like every appliance in the house now. So like, I think there will be room for uh, lots of stories, I hope. And I think it's also driven though by a genuine desire to sort of decenter the perspective you know, so that it isn't just one type of story being told. So sort of on, on the note of like your conceptualization of the book, uh, we have another question from a uh, YouTube Warren Kwan class of 24 asked, uh, what was your inspiration for the book? Was there a particular moment or a particular figure you've encountered in your life that brought you new perspectives about wh what being Asian American means? Ooh. Um, hmm. I mean, there was, you know, a couple of things that sort of nudged it into existence. One was, honestly, the 2016 election. You know, I, I was writing this book for almost four years before that. And something about that, I mean, not something, many things about um, that election kind of just gave me a kick in the pants. Like, one, get to work. And two, like, to try to be engaged in a more meaningful way. I mean, I think early in 2017, when I hit on the current, the, the framework that ended up being the novel, that was the time that, you know, all these sort of like Muslim bans were happening, all these sort of, you know, like it, it, it just felt like all the worst things that, that felt like they might be possible after the election were, were, seemed to be happening, which was a return to this idea of like, you know, or not idea, a, a return to like, xenophobia and exclusion. And so I think that was really, you know, as I, you know, as a child of immigrants, I just wondered, what do my parents think about this? You know, like, what do they think about having been in this country now at that point for 50 years, and then seeing this happen? And it's like, are we going backward? You know, like, I think that was an emotional motivation, just like, to finish this book. I don't know exactly how that translated into like, the writing of it, but definitely got me going. Thanks, Warren. Perfect. And so um, we have uh, two more questions before we end. I think uh, Professor Nadal actually had one more question. Okay, yeah, sure. So um, w one detail that I loved in, the, in your novel is, um, the dad singing John Denver, right? Karaoke, I thought that was such a funny and also very moving moment actually. And so my question is, um, what's your go-to karaoke song? <laughs> um, well, it, it is, uh, it was for a long time, How Deep Is Your Love? Uh, uh, that's a good one, yeah. <laughs> uh, I did a very embarrassing version of Let's Get It On that uh, my wife claims actually is what <laughs> she would want to date me, but it was not a good version. So um, <laughs> what's yours? Um, well, I mean, I should use the pandemic days to practice karaoke because I mean, my, I only have a half octave range, but if push comes to shove, um, I go back to my Filipino roots and sing Frank Sinatra. <laughs> so, but only with someone else. Can't do it alone. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And, and I think we just have one more question, right, Queso, from Daniel yes. Hu, class of 2024. And this will be our final question for tonight. So just this past month, anti-Asian racism attacks of violence and harassment have made their debut in mainstream media coverage, especially in light of the social justice movements from this past summer. Larger conversations have been sparked on the role of Asian Americans in modern America. How do you think the Asian American community can stand in solidarity with other marginalized communities? And how do you try to do this through your writing? Great question, thank you. Uh, and also really quick, I wanna thank you, Jennifer and Kay Savan and all of the people who asked questions and thank you all for you know being part of this. This is such a great, and of course to Professor Nadal, I really appreciate your super thoughtful you know uh, questions and our discussion it was very informative to me. So I, I, I might yeah, thank be you. your brain. Um, I, you know, 
I don't know. I've been thinking about it a lot too. I think um, the only silver lining to you know that is that we get to talk about it. You know, obviously these are these attacks are horrific. You know, the the it, it is a a really sort of um, visceral reminder that um, uh, of the you know the continued sort of feeling of Asian faces and bodies being sort of other, you know, and of not, mm -hmm. uh, of being easily sort of, um, ex not, ex not just excluded, but easily identified, you know, on a very base level. It's like, that is someone I want to, you know, single out and um, as not being from here or as responsible for, you know, a pandemic or whatever it is that goes through their heads. Um, I think, you know, it, it's to me that the, the opportunity, I guess, uh, is um, is that it helps you know bring about Asian Americans in terms of like advocacy and act activity, you know, and passion into larger conversations, and that this is not a zero sum thing at all. That that uh, it, that. Asian American participation in conversations about racial equity and social justice can be additive to the conversation, you know, around lots of other things, including Black Lives Matter, including, you know, lots of other struggles for civil rights and equality, and that um, those conversations, you know, can be, um, can, can, you know, can add to each other instead of sort of, you know, detract. So I, I appreciate the question and, you know, I'll continue to struggle to answer it myself. Thank you so much for your thoughtful response. And with that, that's our final question for the night. This has been such an engaging and informative event. And we really appreciated hearing your unique perspective on the Asian American experience, both in your writing and as a writer yourself. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, both of you. So as the co-presidents of Princeton's Asian American Student Association, we are very excited to have hosted this event with Charles Yu, 2020 National Book Win Award winner for Interior of Chinatown, and Professor Paul Nadal. This event was generously co-sponsored by the Office of the Dean of Undergraduate Students and the Undergraduate Student Government's Projects Board. We extend our deepest thanks to Charles Yu and Professor Nadal for joining us in this virtual conversation. We'd also like to extend a thank you to Princeton University's Dean Dais, Dean Dunn, and Lexi Sarstedt for all their hard work on this event. We'd like to thank Madeline Denman from Penguin Random House for working together with us. And of course, Queso and I are, would like to thank each and every one of our viewers for tuning in with us tonight. On behalf of Princeton Asa and Princeton University, we hope to see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Take you. care.